says the Brexit revolution is growing and gathering momentum. Any institution that stands in its way risks being flattened. Uh, Rachel Sylvester in The Times says the implosion of Labour isn't just a tragedy for the party, but a collective disaster that is distorting the Tory party and poisoning the political environment. The Sun says, whatever you think of Donald Trump, he is the elected head of state of our number one ally. What would withdrawing his invitation to a state visit achieve, it asks. The Guardian pays tribute to the strength of character of the journalist and broadcaster Steve Hewlett, who died yesterday, praising the way his courage and grace about talking, take, taking, talking about his experience of dying for cancer. Cartoonist Morland in The Times gives us his take on Theresa May as Dirty Harry, choosing to sit in the laws as peers begin to debate the Brexit bill. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk, she says. And in The Telegraph, Adams chooses a Blue Planet theme with the Prime Minister as an octopus swatting away dissenting lords, such as Lords Mandelson and Kinnock. Well, joining me to discuss that are the political commentator Steve Richards and the Daily Mail's political editor at large, Isabel Oakshot. Welcome. Oh, hello. I probably ought to say I'm no longer the Daily Mail's oh, right. political editor at large. That's very old news. Oh, Adam. dear, I'm anyway, sorry about so, that. Yeah. <clears throat> we got Steve's title wrong, now we got yours wrong. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not, not a good day. What, what do you want to be known as? I'm a political commentator. Right. Mm -hmm. OK. And author, of course. Uh, now, let's get back to Sajid Javid. Uh, Pretty vicious column in the Daily Mail. Absolutely. It's a completely savage comment, column in the Daily Mail about Sajid Javid. Of course, the Daily Mail has not forgotten or forgiven the fact that Sajid Javid was very Eurosceptic and then came out for Remain. And that was a, a significant crime uh, as far as the Brexit supporting Daily Mail was concerned. And he's really got himself into quite a tangle over these business rates as a, a big revolt on the uh, uh, Tory backbenches over it, and he's made a bad situation worse by uh, sending out a letter to Tory MPs which has got the figures wrong. So, I mean, this was a minister who used to be tipped for great things, potentially still could go on to great things, but he's going to have to find a way out of this, I think, particularly once the Daily Mail gets the bit between their teeth on a uh, a subject like this, they don't let go. I mean, but Steve, somebody's got to pay their taxes, haven't they? Somebody has, but this is a really, I think, rich story. A, it was a rush policy. George Os it was rushed out by George Osborne, announced at a party conference speech several years ago without properly thinking it through. B, it's about um, who pays for local government. Uh, should it be these, in some cases, vulnerable businesses that pay much more for local services in the light of all the cuts, because someone's got to pay for local government. But it also raises the question about how much we all value those physical shops in the age of the internet. So unsurprisingly, Amazon isn't being hit by the business rate in the same way because they do most of their stuff online. It's getting online. a bit of money back, apparently. And it's going to get a bit of money back, whereas the chip shop in St Ives, who's been illustrated as a victim of this, um, is going to be hit punitively. So it raises many, many issues. It hadn't been thought through, and I think this is not going to go away. And the fact that the mail is going for it big time shows how vulnerable the government is on it. But maybe it is time for the high street to go to the wall. I mean, in reality, we all like the idea of the high street, but anyone can see, I think, 10% of shops are boarded up, other ones are charity shops or betting offices. It's a difficult one, this. I mean, mm. I used to live, lucky enough to, used to have lived in Barnes, which has a classic little high street there, very villagey yeah. feeling. And it was really sad to see all those individual little boutiques turning into basically a massive estate agents or, as you say, charity shops. And I think for Tories, that is a difficult question. It's about the market at the end of the day. But I think most people would not want to see their, their local area turning into a little ghost town. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a really interesting question for Tories because it, are you small C conservative wanting those areas like where you used to live to thrive and to walk around and go to these small shops or are you just going to accept the market will wipe those out because the demand is for people to buy things on the internet and that's why this story is so potent because there's absolutely no doubt if this revaluation goes ahead combined with local councils power to set rates as they wish many shops will close all right so have you got an answer no, that's why we're not politicians. Um, yeah, I have, actually. <laughs> I think more money should come from central government. The cuts from central government have been too deep. And it's a myth that they haven't... You know, it's this myth that all oh, these cuts haven't affected anything. They have. And local government and 
elderly care are real victims, to name one example. And in fact, what's going on is the government is trying to shift responsibility to local government in a lot of areas, saying, oh, yeah, you can raise your own business rates or uh, you can take charge of... Absolutely. I mean, care. in terms of uh, do we have a solution, I mean, clearly there is going to have to be some kind of gradation here or, you know, some kind of compromise because these rises are just ridiculous. Now, the Lords, uh, Tim Stanley, another angry column, um, slightly dodgy history about the French Revolution, but basically saying... Louis uh, uh, the, the 16th resisted reform and ended up getting his head cut off. It will be the same treatment for the Lords if they get in the way of Brexit. Yeah, I don't know why all the Brexiteers are so angry all the time. They've won. Uh, they seem to always win and still be angry. We need you to know. keep the momentum up, Steve. <laughs> you, you act as if there's no threat to this from well, people like you. Uh, well, I wish there was more of a threat, uh, Isabel. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much of one. I mean, the Lords have been very clear, couldn't be clearer. The leader of the Labour group in the Lords has said there will be no ping-pong with the House of Commons. Uh, Theresa May, who was in there in a rather smart move yesterday, presiding over them all fiercely, has been told by her, and she was the one who could stop it, uh, she will reach her March deadline for triggering Article 50. And yet the anger of these people, uh, fearful that these lords are going to block it at any We're second. just keeping your toes to the fire, <laughs> yeah, Is it necessary? I mean, surely we now well, look, that Brexit look, is going to happen, look, everyone accepts it's going to happen. If we're talking about this editorial, the idea that the lords might be wiped out, personally, I think that's ludicrous. It's apocalyptic. It isn't going to happen. Might not be a bad idea, uh, it, course, Whether yeah. or not it would be a bad idea, uh, Adam, you and I are both old enough to have been through multiple attempts by governments to reform the House of Lords, never mind wipe them up. It never happens. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but the general point that the Lords should yeah. not frustrate this process is a legitimate one. Do you one. think it was a good move of uh, Mrs May to go in there and glare at them yesterday? I thought it was brilliant PR. Good I for it was her. a very, very smart move. Whoever thought yeah. that one up was being very clever. The symbolism of this figure from the elected chamber looking down on them with that brilliant. ferocious glare was a very clever move. Now, that's what the cartoon is to do. What about the Labour Party, Steve? You're an expert on the Labour Party. Do you agree with Rachel Sylvester that uh, uh, I, she's I, actually damaging the Tories as well? Because, I mean, my answer, job done then from a Marxist perspective. If you <laughs> <laughs> well, it is... I, no, I don't think it's damaging the Conservative Party. I think it's much harder to govern with a formidable opposition, actually. I mean, there's a slight myth around this. For example, John Major went through hell in the mid-1990s when he was Prime Minister over Europe, partly because he faced a strong opposition when Tony Blair was walking on water 40 points ahead in the polls. That was the source of his torment, partly, as well as his own party. So I think it's a myth. I mean, I think it's easier for Theresa May facing a weak opposition. But where she is right is that weakness distorts the whole of politics. There's a good line. I disagree with her about, oh, it's all got to be back to the centre ground because she doesn't define what the centre ground is. But she points out the fact that Theresa May knows that she could hold an election at any time gives her an extraordinary power now because she would win. And that is a very important observation, I think, and is the context in which all is happening. Do you want to say anything about Mr Corbyn? I, I mean, I would agree with most of this piece. Um, at the end, however, she says that there's a, a sort of vacancy for a new party, and I'm very sceptical about new parties. Mm, the too. history of them getting anywhere is a pretty poor one, um, so I don't subscribe Look, to that. Well, there's a new player coming on the West End about the Gang of Four, so, uh, the, and the rise of the SDP. That should be interesting. Thank you both very much indeed. <laughs> This is All Out Politics. Up next, we'll debate the Lords debating Brexit. <laughs>